Welcome to SolarWinds Lab. I know we usually come on strong with the latest and greatest new features or cool monitoring tricks, but today we are going back to the basics. Um, I don't know if I can actually not talk about what our products can do. Oh, come on. Before you were this great and mighty techno-evangelista that you are today, you were a network engineer. So, you know, the thing I love about Lab is that we can really get our geek on, and I know that the audience is going to always come with us, but I always wonder, what about the folks who are kind of new to this? You know, what are they thinking about this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, we run into that person all the time at conventions, user groups, and when we sit down with new customers. Right. So... This episode will help you if you're just getting started monitoring or if you've been doing it for a while, but you might have missed some of the fundamentals along the way. Yeah, it's also good for people who are interested in monitoring, even if they won't be using or managing monitoring themselves. For example, your manager or people on other teams who are requesting monitoring, but they don't know how it works exactly. So where do you want to start? It depends. Uh, when you peel away all the shiny graphics and awesome automation, monitoring has always come down to the same set of techniques and protocols. So why don't we start with that? Okay, good plan. Hi, I'm Leon Adato. And I'm Chris O'Brien. Welcome to SolarWinds Lab. We're just going to spend the next few minutes or so talking about what monitoring is, the basics of how it works, and what it really means to you in a real-world use case. As always, when you join us live, you can ask us questions in that chat box over there. Yeah. That's because, uh, no, if you don't see that chat box, that's because you aren't watching us live. And to do that, you want to go to lab.solarwinds.com and register for updates on new episodes as well as tell us what you would like to see in future episodes. I'd also like to mention that everything that we're going to talk about today you can find in an ebook called Monitoring 101 that we've created just for this. So scribbling notes not required. Right, exactly. So you can just sit back and listen and let the wisdom of monitoring glory just wash over you. Right. So I think any conversation about monitoring basics has to start with... Ping. Ping. Can't get much more basic than ping. Good old ping. Um, most people who've been with a computer for more than, I don't know, 15 minutes probably are used to it. You've got, you know... You go to a DOS prompt. Yes, it's called a DOS prompt. Gosh, darn it, youngsters. And you type ping and an IP address or a machine name, and it will go out. And what, what is it really doing here? I mean, what's? Uh, it's sending a packet to the device to see if that device will respond, and then it times how long it takes for that response to get back. Right, so the important thing is not just it's there, but also um, how many replies, because sometimes you can get one reply, one yep. drop, one so reply, one drop. And you get more data. Right, mm -hmm. and then also how fast that response time is. Mm -hmm. Now, by itself, it's like, is it there? Okay, great. And lots of people start their monitoring experience by writing their own little ping utility or a script or what have you. But uh, what I want to do is I want to show sort of the result of ping. If you take a look here, what you see is this graph here. Um, and, and I want to specify that we are being tool agnostic. It's just that the tools that we happen to have in our toolbox are... Some solar winds yeah, we tools, want to so. graph ping, and this is how we graph ping. Right, you sorry. Know, almost every monitoring tool in the pl on the planet probably has some sort yes. of ping capability. In any case, um, when you collect the ping information and you store it in a database, what you get the ability to do is you get to track it over time now. So you can see not just that it responded at these points in time, but also how quickly or slowly it responded as well. Yep, and when that changed, which is a critical piece of information telling you uh, about how that infrastructure is doing, how the node is doing, plus how the path to get there is doing. Right, and, and there's a couple of interesting use cases. Uh, in, in one situation that I was in a couple of years ago, we had a 10 megabit circuit, mm -hmm. but the provider had only configured half that much speed, and so what we were seeing, seeing was exactly one packet out of every two was dropping. Yeah. So this chart would say, you know, it's there, it's gone. It's there, it's gone, it's there, it's gone. Yeah, so it, packet loss detection, one of the key use cases for ping. Right, in, in addition to the normal stuff, which would be, you know, is it there? When did the outage start? It's, you know, this stopped responding, say, three minutes before we detected the application was down. Yeah, and speaking of uh, is it there and, and when exactly that timing occurred, ping is really light. So it's one of the ones where you can send it constantly and have great granularity as this happened at, you know, 3.06 p.m. rather than, you know, 3.30 or 4. Right, exactly. So I think the next stop we have to hit is SNMP. Sounds good. So um, SNMP has a particular structure, and my friend Steve Clausen actually gave a really good example of that. So I wanted to sort of bring that down, but you know, all all props go to him. Um, so SNMP 
pulls data out of systems, but it has a very specific hierarchical structure. So on the box is an SNMP agent, which is collecting data and putting it in different buckets. And what you're normally going to see with SNMP is this number, you know, 1.3.6.1.4.1.5 or something like that. And, and a lot of people get overwhelmed by that. It's, it's sort of like IP addresses on steroids. Yeah. You know, like, I'm never going to remember that. And you don't have to remember that. But the way that Steve uh, explained it was when you're looking at an SNMP list or hierarchy, what it's really doing is telling you how to get to my house. So if you look at the screen here, you can see that, you know, what it's saying is take the first left, number one, at ISO. Okay, then take the third left at org, take the sixth left at, left at DOD, take the first left at internet, take, let's say, uh, the uh, second left at management, it's going to take a minute, take the you know, first left at mid, and so on and so forth, until you finally get down to the actual data point, which could be CPU or name or whatever. But so when you do a SNMP thing, you're going to be using this number, and that's what that's going to be referring to. So, and this is called a MIB, a management information block. Yeah, and we can see that number constructed right there on the screen. Uh, right. We took 136121, and that's how you got to the information you need to get to. Whatever it is, yep. exactly. So, but that's the structure of it, but there's mm -hmm. two very specific things you can do with SNMP. There's, there's polling and there's traps. So let's talk a little bit about polling. Yeah, okay, so there's a number of different commands for how you get that uh, SNMP data off that infrastructure component you're trying to get data about, but the one most people care about is SNMP get. Right, and it's pretty simple, right? You do SNMP get, that number, and the box should respond. So, for example... Plus a really crappy password. A really bad password, a really bad open text password. We, we won't get into the SNMP Ether, versions yeah, yeah. or anything like that. So an SNMP command might look something like this, SNMP get, version one, that's SNMP version one. The community string is public because of course it is. Very impressive. Yes, Very I know. Then you have things that are a little bit more recognizable, the uh, 10.199.4.3. And then notice I didn't, I didn't use a number. I used the name because you can actually, if you go back here, I can actually use the shorthand of whatever it is that I'm going. For example, if that I go to system me. and I want the object ID and I want, let's say, cold start or whatever. So instead of saying, you know. You got to use the numbers, man. I know, I you know. You got to use the numbers. I, I, it's a 1.3.6.1.2, one one whatever, whatever, whatever. And um, that can be called rad, uh, rad ISM 900 cold start. You could do that. Um, so I did because this is a pretty standard one. The sys description, system description dot zero. And the system, this this IP address responded with the name of the system and what kind it is, what kind of machine it is, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and very very snappy, right? Right, and that's the other thing. Just like with ping, SNMP is very very tight. It's yeah. very small. It's very efficient, and so it's nice to use almost every device from your network devices to your servers to your coffee pot to your Internet of Things thing or whatever. Most of them will support SNMP at some level. Yep. It's most well known for networking devices. That's where it's traditionally like enabled by default for a bunch of network gear. Uh, Windows, you add your own uh, executable to get that functionality, um, but very ubiquitous. Right now, the one problem is that you can imagine on a on a server, for example, you're going to collect a lot of different things. It's got yeah. five, you know, it's got six CPUs and it's got ten different memory counters that I want to get. Am I really doing an SNMP get this and then get that and then get this and get that? That's why they introduced the git bulk command, so you can get a whole bunch of these things at the same time. Right. Um, another option is SNMP walk. And what SNMP walk is about is really um, going to the first, uh, first OID and asking for that OID and then asking for what the next one is. Um, so the, the thought process there is I don't know everything uh, that is specified on that piece of, de piece of equipment, uh, what information is available where. So I'm going to ask for the first piece, which is there by standard, and then I'm going to ask the device to give me whatever's next. Right. And by walking through that whole thing, we can get all of the data and have that all available to view. So on the screen, I have a SNMP walk utility. There's the IP address that I'm looking for. Again, my you know, very secure community string. Scan, and it's going to go through you know, a significant number, about 131, 1,310,000 uh, object IDs. And what you end up with is 
There we go. So there's your walk. It yep. starts at the first number that responds, and you go down through, and you get the, the IDs. So a lot of times, a system, a monitoring tool, will do that once to a machine to find out which things it responds on. And then it will simply record that in the database and only use those the correct ones from that point yeah, forward. Yeah, clearly SNMP walk is a whole lot heavier than a simple SNMP git. So SNMP walk to understand it, and then SNMP git to be efficient. Very good. So that's that's getting. That's when I want to know CPU, and I ask it every five minutes, and I yep. get that stuff. Five I store it in the database. Mm -hmm. But what about traps? Yeah, so I mean, if you think about how you're getting something every five minutes, what happened in between? Or sometimes you have specific events where you want notification right away. You want triggered notification. You don't want to just pull that information where you're waiting for the data that you need. So they introduce SNMP traps. SNMP traps um, is sort of the reverse. So rather than your uh, management entity pulling the SNMP agent, which is on your router or whatever it is, mm -hmm. the router itself will send information to the management entity uh, when that information becomes available. So an interface goes down, you know about it right away. Exactly. Yeah, and it's just-in-time information. That's the good part. So you don't have to keep asking, you know, did you just restart or anything like that. The bad part is it's not guaranteed delivery. Yeah, UDP. So Right. So uh, unfortunately, if the system goes down fast and it tried to send a message but it couldn't just do it, then of course you're not going to get that. But there's enough other evidence, things that you can pick up. It starts back up and says, oh, by the way, I had a cold start. I didn't expect to be shut down a minute ago. And so you can tell that things happened after the fact. Yeah, and uh, as with most other monitoring technologies, really what you want to do is balance the two together, right? So uh, SNMP trap may send you a notification that an interface is down, but if that's uh, the uplink to the rest of your network, maybe that SNMP trap doesn't ever go out, doesn't ever reach you. So then you're relying on your other tools like ping or SNMP git to tell you that they have lost connectivity. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so SNMP trap is one way to send triggered information, but mm -hmm. if I've got a lot of information, like log files, the next logical step is to use syslog. So syslog, again, is triggered, but um, uh, lends itself to sending a whole lot more data. A whole lot more in terms of many, many messages or the length of the messages? Both of those things. Okay. Um, and the other thing that I like about syslog is that it's very freeform. You know, where we talked a lot about how SNMP has this very hierarchical structure. And oh, by the way, if you were looking for a piece of data and it's not in the MIB, you're out of luck. Yeah. You can't just make it up. But with syslog, there are actually clients that you can install on your boxes. Now, if you have a Linux or Unix box, it's built in. If you have a Windows box, you need a client. Um, but you can actually say when such and such happens on the box, you can trigger a syslog message and it'll say anything you want it to do. Yep. And, and then, go ahead, sorry. And even easier for network devices, you tend to just go into the network device and say, point your syslog over to this server, whatever your server is, and then you're getting all the data. Right. And for network devices, you can't really customize them, although. Um, you can specify, syslog has different levels. There's the warning level, the debug level, the inform level. So you can group by those. Yep, like threat level red, right. threat level yellow. <laughs> ah, everyone, yeah. So you can say that I only want the things there. But sometimes there's interesting information in the informs. Um, I know that all of our security professionals and audit professionals are very, very focused on uh, syslog messages. Yeah, it's fantastic with firewalls because um, oftentimes someone will come in or you get a help desk request that says, I couldn't reach such and such application. And sometimes the simplest way, rather than rooting through all of your firewall rules, is to just check the logs. Was that guy's IPs blocked for anything in the past right. hour or whenever he was requesting it? And syslog makes that really easy. All the data comes from the firewall to your administration thing. It's a simple search uh, of a text string. Right, and that's, that's an important point is that you have many, many devices, whether they're firewalls or network devices out there, they're all sending their syslog into a central yep, listening server that's collecting it together. That lets you dumpster dive through looking for trends or patterns, whether you're using a, uh, uh, a CM and a SEIM, a security information event management system. I think I got that right. That's pretty good. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, which collects all the logs together, or you just have a central, you know, location for all your messages or whatever it is that you're you're looking to do. Um, some messages, especially on the network side, only appear as syslog. There, I've always had a lot of fun with these. One is uh, BGP neighbor down when you're yep. setting up a, a VPN connection. And the other one is, 
Hopefully no one's dealing very much with Spanning Tree anymore, but if you are, when there's elections in Spanning Tree, that only appears as a syslog message. It doesn't appear as anything else, but it can be very, very useful. Yeah, absolutely. Building rules based on what you're seeing in the logs and, and sort of when you do a troubleshooting ses session, often you'll check the log, see if anything quirky happened, and sometimes you'll find, oh, there's a Spanning Tree election I did not expect to happen, or a BGP neighborship, or OSPF, or whatever it is, a lot of sort of esoteric bits of information are on the syslog that are not anywhere else. So as you go through the troubleshooting session, you find some interesting piece of data that clued you into a problem, um, you can actually use that ahead of time for the future problem by setting up search rules and so forth. Excellent. So what I want to do is take a brief side trip into the land of WMI, now uh, Windows Management Interface, or Windows Management Instrumentation, uh, is obviously for Windows machines only. You're not going to find this running on your routers uh, or your it's unit the first boxes. word, Windows. Yeah, it, it, is, it is sort of key in there. And for the most part, what you're doing is collecting the same stuff that you could get with SNMP. There's a couple of reasons why you would care about WMI, though. Um, the first one is that WMI is native to Windows. It's on more or less by default, whereas SNMP you have to turn on. You have to have some, if you have a large environment, you have some sort of effort to turn on SNMP. Yeah, so generally for network devices, you're thinking SNMP. Generally for Windows devices, you're thinking WMI. Right. That's the pro side of it. And you can get some really good information. In fact, you can get more information off of Windows boxes than sometimes SNMP can. However, WMI by default requires about 100 bajillion ports to be open. Yeah, it's a little ridiculous. Always irritating to open those ports for your firewalls. Um, you can specify uh, uh, static ports, but that gets into a whole nother mess. Right. Um, but the the uh, nugget here is if you're having trouble getting WMI bat, uh, data back, you need to be checking your firewall. Right, exactly. But more, and, and also, again, I'm a fan of SNMP. On Windows boxes, you can go WMI as long as there's no issue with it, but you should know that both techniques exist for those kinds of servers. So that really covers the basics of the basics. Um, now I want to start to dovetail into some of the more advanced monitoring topics, but they're still part of Monitoring 101. They're just not sort of that foundational layer of monitoring. Yep, so let's talk about NetFlow first. I love NetFlow. Okay. As a network administrator, NetFlow answers the question for me. Uh, so my interface is uh, being heavily utilized. What's using that interface? So let's take a look at our interface here and take an uh, example of what that looks like. Um, so here we're looking at an interface on this device called BOWAN. That's Body Odor WAN. In right, case of course you're it is. Right. Uh, gigabit Ethernet 012022. So on this specific virtual interface, or sub-interface rather, um, we can see uh, the top left graph is telling us what are the most um, talkative endpoints, which endpoints are using the most traffic, mm -hmm. and when are they using that traffic. And the top right graph shows us uh, conversations. Conversation is, I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you, to you on specific ports. So web server, uh, my SQL server, MS SQL server, what application is involved in our conversation. Right, and, and yeah, the conversation piece is the part that I actually like. I, I know that as a network guy, you want to know, you know, it's, it, the circuit is pegged. You know that it's passing this enormous amount of data. Now, who's the culprit? Is it, you know, Fred in accounting who's, you know, streaming Netflix, or is it something else? You know, that it, it's the uh, authentication traffic that's going to a really chatty Active Directory server for example. So you want to know that. But what really excites me about it is the other pieces, the conversation pieces. Because NetFlow, by default, can be broken down as, for example, the top 10 conversations here. And I can see that you know, between this server and that server, that device and that device, even if I'm not monitoring those devices, I can tell what kind of data what kind of information is being passed and which interfaces? So you like the global view, yeah. whereas I'm zoned into a specific interface and fixing that interface. You're saying, what is my entire network doing and what are the devices that are on that network doing, even if I don't monitor them directly? Oh, yeah, because a lot of times as a monitoring engineer, I'm, I'm asked, like, how much web traffic are we seeing on this interface or how much whatever? And again, here we have conversations between two endpoints. 
But there, we can also take the data and look at the different kinds of data. So you can see that the web traffic, port 80, is happening. It's passing 5.6 gig currently uh, ingress, and then another 14.5 gig uh, egress. And I can see who is using up all that traffic. Again, is it Fred in accounting who's you know binge watching uh, Walking Dead, or is it some you know is it something else that's going on? The other nice thing about this, from a security standpoint, is that I can look at traffic and say, wait, wait. We have no business talking to that endpoint at all. And you can start to pick that up from NetFlow, where you might not see that in, with other monitoring types. So where does this NetFlow data come from? Good question. It is a, um, it is a closed, not a closed protocol. It's a protocol developed initially by Cisco, although lots of network devices now support it. And it comes from one particular exporter. So you have a router that sits somewhere on your network, typically close to the center. And it is watching the traffic coming through. And every so often, it will throw out a bundle of conversation data to a machine that's listening, like our NetFlow listener, our NetFlow server. So every so often, the router will pass this big chunk of data, and it will pick it up, it will parse it out, and then it will be able to display this stuff. You can do it with multiple devices across your environment, but you're not monitoring every single device. You're only yep. monitoring a few things in that soft, chewy center of your network. Yeah, the, the WAN edge is uh, uh, sort of the center of the WAN, but the WAN edge at each one of your locations is a common place to deploy um, NetFlow exporting. Um, the other thing to note is you're not sending all of the data, right? Because, of course, your link is going to be right. heavily utilized if you double all, all of your data. So what you're really doing is the, the router looks at all of the packets and extracts a couple of key pieces of information and then exports only that. And there's some other summary functions that happen in there as well. Right. So it's, it's a very small portion of the total data. Exactly. It's still a lot of data. I will, we have to be honest yeah. about that. There's a lot of data. You have to have the right kind of hardware to monitor and collect this. But once you have it, the insight you can get is invaluable. Yeah. as a network engineer. You need to have flow monitoring uh, in your network, regardless of where you get it from. You need to have flow monitoring. Definitely. All right, so it's time to talk about IPSLA. IPSLA, I think, is the most underutilized monitoring technique that we have in this list. You've been waiting this entire episode. I have been waiting to talk IPSLA. about IPSLA. Yeah. I love I IPSLA, and very few people use it. I agree. Um, so let's get a couple of basics out of the way, and then we'll talk about why I love it. Sure thing. Um, the basics are, uh, it stands for IP, Internet Protocol, Service Level Agreement. So it's focused on service level agreement, but that's not really the only thing you use it for. Um, in fact, I would say that's kind of vestigial. Um, the next thing, uh, we should mention about it is it's synthetic um, and it's Cisco proprietary. So yeah. it's sourced from your Cisco devices. Cisco devices are what you need to be running IPSLA. Juniper and others have similar sort of uh, peers, but it's not quite called IPSLA. Right. Um, and it's synthetic. What synthetic means is rather than um, like WMI or SNMP, sending a question to the network device and having that network device tell you its answer, Instead, the synthetic monitoring sends synthetic traffic that looks right. sort of like your uh, user traffic and then measures the results on that traffic, which is fantastic, right? It tells you what actually happens to traffic that you send across the network rather than what network devices think is going on. Right, and it tells you at 2 o'clock in the morning when there may not be any actual users on the network, yep. so you can find out at you know 2.30 in the morning that there's a problem and you can get a... Uh, uh, call or a trouble ticket in place rather than waiting until you know nine o'clock when everyone hits the office and yep. all of a sudden that's when you find out that whatever it is is broken. Yep, so that's a big difference between synthetic versus uh, regular polled monitoring. Um, the next thing uh, I, I like is that you can use IPSLA to sort of mimic traffic. Mm -hmm. So rather than just sending a ping, for instance, to get latency, you can send uh, TCP traffic on port 80 uh, or TCP traffic on port 443 to get an idea of what web browsing feels like. And you can see the uh, behavior you have in place on your network for your web browsing traffic. Uh, if you've got QoS or what have you that mm -hmm. treats different traffic differently, that's super important. Right. Now, we're dancing around, I think, the, the, the big issue, which is that IPSLA is predominantly used for monitoring 
voice traffic. Yeah. It's mostly used, I mean, when you hear about you know, IPSLA, it's mostly in the context of call quality and whether you're, call, I'm, I'm not saying that's the only use case. And, and that's an important point, especially in Monitoring 101. You're going to hear that IPSLA, it's for phones. No, it's for a lot of things, but the predominant usage of it is with voice traffic. Yeah, my take on that is that you run IPSLA when you want to make sure that your network is running right. People realize they need to do that when phones are dropping, but they should be doing that all the time. They really go. should. Um, and one of the, the other thing that's great about IPSLA is how granular it gets, right? Mm -hmm. So whereas ping, you're usually sending a couple of pings every uh, minute or half minute, uh, even at aggressive thresholds like that, it's just a couple, right? So if you're trying to detect something like 10% packet loss that's super impacting to your user base, you would have to send a whole lot of packets. Generally, that's not how you use ping in a monitoring sure. tool. That's what IPSLA fixes for you. You can detect, you know, from 5 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., I had 10% packet loss because IPSLA can provide that level of granularity. Let's take right. a look at it. I was going to say, he's really passionate about this. We've talked a lot about it, so let's We got to take a look. In. Okay, so here's an example of a map that you could build using IPSLA. Yeah, and this really speaks to IPSLA sort of WAN-centric perspective. A lot of people use it over their long-distance connections, their connections that connect different offices they have in different geographic regions, and then you want to visualize that. Um, so this is just happens to be how our tool does that. Um, so let's jump into a specific IPSLA operation and see what sort of data we get. So there's a couple of things going on. I'll talk about this, the basics here, and then I'll hand it off to you about the uh, VoIP specific stuff. Okay. So in general, we're sending a whole lot of packets from one router, the router we configured, um, to send the packets to uh, another device, whether it's a router or not, it sort of depends on the operation type. We may get into that. But in this case, it's going from Ottawa to Austin. Yes, in Ottawa that to direction. Austin. Yep, real traffic going in that direction. And then we can get things like the packet loss and the latency uh, at a very high uh, degree of accuracy. Um, and at a high uh, interval rate. Um, there's a n bunch of other things that we can get that are 100% unique to IPSLA um, that feed into this MOS thing. What is that? So MOS stands for Mean Opinion Score. Okay. So when people say MOS score, they're, you know, it's a MOS, it's a MOS score score. Score. So anyway, that's not important. What it is is they got a whole bunch of people, real human beings, on uh, phones, and they set up calls between those people, and then they injected jitter, packet loss, and latency in, and then they had them rate on a scale of one to five how good they would. They said that phone call was, and after doing that with hundreds or maybe even thousands of people, they created this scale of one to five call quality, which was your MOS is. So what IPSLA does. So let me take a step back. To measure call quality, you have really two choices from a monitoring standpoint. Either you set up a laptop in two different places and have those laptops make fake phone calls to each other all the time, and then you have to have lots of laptops and lots of fake phone calls, and they make the phone call, they test the jitter and packet loss, they ship that data back to the mothership, uh, you know, the monitoring tool. That's one way to do it, but it's a little bit bulky. Or you have the routers themselves do this fake phone call. Now, you're not getting all the way to the end, right? You're not getting from the router to the actual desk, mm -hmm. but it's more or less close enough. It's the important bits, yeah. Right. So um, those routers are automatically making phone calls, and it also means that from whatever point in your network to the other point that you're going to be supporting phone calls, those routers are doing it anyway. So this is, uh, in this case, on this Ottawa to Austin connection, we can see that from, you know, morning, whatever it is, until 6 p.m., or from, yeah, from, from whatever time it is to 6 p.m., the call quality was around 2. It got better. It went up to a 3. By the way, 3 is considered basic, average, good enough. Anything lower than 3 is considered bad. 5 is considered stupendous. So, in the, you know, from 6 o'clock at night until 6 o'clock in the morning, so basically when no one was on the phone, uh, the call quality was, you know, three. It was good. And then as soon as people jumped on the call, then it went right back down to, you know, one, two, or even one. Yeah, it's a really clever way to pull in several different metrics and make something that is uh, impactful to humans. Like, right. what is the opinion that someone would have if they were on the phone at that point in time? And they say, this is okay, this is good, this is great. Uh, but that pulls in jitter, pulls in packet loss, pulls in latency. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And those are all the things that would affect any sort of sensitive program, which isn't just phone, by the way. It's also your video. Uh, it's also um, 
there's there's a few other applications that are extremely time sensitive in terms yep, of when real time. things uh, arrive. So that's one thing. However, in terms of talking about use cases, I want to point out, as you mentioned earlier, that this is good for other things besides just phones. So anybody who comes to you and says IPSLA is just for monitoring phones, one example of that is you want to know whether your DHCP server is responding appropriately. This is a pretty common thing. And lots of people want to monitor this. It's an application cut type monitor. There's a problem though. Your DHCP server will only respond to requests inside that network segment. So if you're at the home office and you have a DHCP server in a warehouse, you can't find out if that DHCP, you can find out if it's running, you can find out yep. if the service is running, you can find out, you can even query and say, do you have IP addresses available? But is it really handing out addresses? Yep. You can't do because your monitoring server is over here and the DHCP server is there. Well, wait a minute. DHCP is one of the SLA operations. You can actually have the router at the warehouse ask the DHCP server at the warehouse, hey, do you, do you have an address that I could have? It's not going to get one. You're not going to use it up. But it says, I, I'm looking for an address. The DHCP server says, I got one for you. And then the router doesn't say anything. It doesn't actually complete the transaction. So that's one use case. And other uh, IPSLA operations include checking DNS, checking FTP or TFTP servers. Um, you can do UDP, TCP, uh, ICMP, ICMP path. There's a whole bunch of them. There's really a lot of functionality there. Right. So again, this is an advanced topic, but it's something that even in a Monitoring 101 context, you need to know that it exists and that it is a technique that is well worth looking into. All right, on to the next topic, which is config backup. Another one you've been waiting to a talk about. A subject near and dear to my heart. Yep. So uh, there's a number of things that this this uh, technology can do for you. But the first one is, you know, it's 2 a.m., I get a message from monitoring that uh, my uh, data center is down, um, and I go and look at monitoring, maybe drive out to the data center and find out a device is broken, right? right? So I call up Cisco in a fran frantic tone, and I'm like, hey, get me a device as soon as possible. Got the four-hour SLA, so they ship it out via courier. I'm sitting there at the data center like, okay, it's coming, it's coming, we're gonna be okay. And then the device gets there, and I unpack it, and like rack it up, plug in the cables, I'm starting to think about configuration, I plug in my console port, and I'm like, oh, I, I kind of have to configure this, don't I? To do all the things that it was doing before, all the QoS settings. Now let and... me see if I can remember the entire config <laughs> without error off right. the top of my, no, you can't remember that. There's no one good enough to remember the entire large config. There's so, it, like. Configs are a live thing. Right. As time goes on, you do all of these incremental changes to get them where you want to be. You can't just remember that. You can't configure it on the fly. That's a living document that you've built up and you okay. need to protect it. Config Backup does that for you. So the basics of how Config Backup work, um, let's start jumping into the demo here. Sure. So we're looking at a good old Bowan, which I have to say Bo is a branch office. Oh, not, okay. It's okay. not, no, it's not that, no. All right. And we go down to configs. So uh, uh, in this case, we're backing up the configuration uh, every 30 minutes. You can do it every hour. It sort of depends on how often you make changes. Uh, my device went down in this scenario, and I go to the configs tab, and look at that. Right. I've and, got my config. That's like gold. Right, and, an and it's here, even if the device is now, you know, it has exploded and is now a pile of bubbling molten metal. It doesn't yes. matter. You've got this information here. Yeah, so click into that guy. I got to see it. I got to make sure, by the way, when you're when you're setting up config backup, you want to click and look at the results. Right. Make sure you have it there. There it is. There's my config. And you can literally, I mean, worst case scenario, you could literally highlight, copy, and then in a FTP session on your new bo the, the new device that came in, you know, with four hour service, you could just paste that in and be good to go. You don't have to, but the fact is, is that that's, you could literally just do that. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love. I get such a sense of like everything's <laughs> going to be all right when I have that config backup. But that's not the only thing config backup is good for. No, it's not. So there's uh, a few different things. First of all, just like you can back up the config, you can push the config out. So really, in that disaster scenario, you you know you know it's broken, or you get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning. Hey, this thing just completely is belly up. Like, what am I going to do? You say, no problem. Go grab the spare off the shelf because we are thoughtful network engineers who have spares. You grab the spare off the shelf, rack it, 
configure it with this IP address. That's all you need to do because then I can actually go in and restore. I'm going to go back one screen. And again, it has the right IP address. It's the right kind of box. That's really all I need. I can go back. So you don't even have to like you know copy and paste it. You can you know two o'clock in the morning, you get that phone call. You say no problem. Just get the spare off the shelf because we are network professionals. We have spares waiting for things like this. Take the spare, rack it, plug it in, get the cables all plugged in. Then um, you want to give it the right IP address because that's how I'm going to get to mm -hmm. it. And then on this screen, on this config screen, back where we started down at the bottom, I can upload a config. I can say which version of the running config. I can click upload, I'm not going to right now, and it will push the config right back out again so I can push it back. Yep. But there's another thing you can do, and that's compare. Even more. Even, but Even that's more. not all. So you're backing up your configs every half hour, every hour, every day, whatever it is. What you can do is automatically compare the one I just backed up to the one I had before or to a baseline. It should look like this all the time. And I've got a picture of what that looks like. And then with highlighting, all right, so yellow means it doesn't really matter because it's a timestamp. But oh, wait a minute. Somebody added a QoS policy in here that wasn't there before. So I can, do a, I can compare these two configs, and then I can alert on that. I can send a message saying, hey, this changed. If you didn't have a change control, you weren't expecting it, someone's messing around with your stuff. Yep. And it basically constantly keeps you aware of what is changing in your network's configuration, which is a super important question to be able to answer. And I think as network guys, um, we are very fortunate that vendors uh, have chosen to really, unlike Linux and Unix and server, Windows servers and what have you, uh, network devices have a config file which really represents 95% of the configuration state of that device. Mm -hmm. So it is really something that, you know, anything changes in your network in terms of configuration, it's in this file somewhere. So keeping track of those, being able to diff them, super powerful. Yeah, very powerful. Um, Another thing I want to mention, <laughs> in yes. case you'd like to think about yours for a while. Another thing I'd like to mention is um, we talked about the polling interval. You can do every 30 minutes, hour, every day for people who don't have their configuration change very much. Uh, another thing that uh, is common in lots of tools is that you can uh, set up triggered config backup. So if you using the syslog functionality or the SMP trap functionality, rather, that we talked about earlier, right. if your device tells you, I've had a configuration change, someone did write mem, right, then that can uh, trigger the monitoring solution to go and pull a copy of that configuration so that it's always very up to date and your timestamps for when the config change is pretty pretty accurate. Another great thing. Right, and, and that gets us into, uh, I always joke that network configuration management is like a gateway drug to software-defined networking. Because once you have the automate, you know, you get a trap, it's changed. Okay, back up the config. Okay, analyze it. Well, now you can do automated other things. For example, if the change wasn't approved or wasn't expected, you can actually take that device and now quarantine it you know, using a configuration change. You can also check to make sure that there are policies, which we're not going to talk about today, but there are policies that are in place that you can push not the whole config, but a piece of the config in so it fits the policy rules in your organization. We're, we're trying so hard to keep it on the basics. There's just right. so much good stuff you can do once you get the basics of config backup going. Just get that going. Right, and that's true of all the monitoring that we talked about today, is that once you have the basics of it, then sort of the sky's the limit and you can do almost anything you want to do. There is obviously a lot more to monitoring than just that. Sure, there's log files, perfmon counters, and even more esoteric solutions like vendor-specific APIs. Right, not to mention bare-knuckle scripting solutions. But this is definitely, I think, a good start. Yeah, and one more reminder that you can find everything we talked about with even more detail in the Monitoring 101 ebook. Right, and speaking of reminders, uh, I want to remind everyone to visit lab.solarwinds.com to get updates on new episodes as well as leave comments on what you'd like to see us cover in the future. For SolarWinds Lab, I'm Liana Dada. And I'm Chris O'Brien. Thanks for watching.